we're going to get into the weeds a little bit about how you can build your community, have more fellowship, more friendship, more camaraderie, more partnership. Because if you do, you will have a greater likelihood to. So here's the crazy thing. And this is all going to lead to a series of things that were the most important things that ever happened to me. And again, we're back to this has been, for me, the most valuable part of who I've become more so than whatever fitness opportunities I've been given. It's really, it's really my, my. Well, hello everybody, it is I, Tony Horton. How are you on this Tuesday? And if it's a Tuesday, it must be a Tony's talk. Or, no, not plural, there's only one of me. A Tony talk, and uh, here's what's going on this evening. Uh, tonight, I wanna to talk about friendship and partnership and community in relationships and companionships and camaraderie and fellowship and togetherness and connection and how uh, important that is for our progress in life. And um, from my own personal experience, I'm waving and waving. I'm waving to all the friendly people. Um, for my more waving, I might miss some, some of you. And so the reason why I believe this is such an important topic is because far too often, one of the main reasons why people aren't as fit and as uh, healthy and aren't eating as well is because they don't have the right kind of influence around them. They don't have the right people. And sometimes you might find yourself in a situation or two or three or four or five, depending on whether it's work or family or community or neighborhood or whatever it is, um, where you don't have maybe the most ideal group of people around you. And so as we get older, uh, which I happen to be, I gotta fix that, That's, that'll make me nuts the whole time. Wait a minute, wait, I can do it. Get it in there, get that little hair in there. These are important things. Um, uh, and where was I? And I think the reason, all the people now, wave, wave, waving back to you. And so my goal here as a fitness uh, finiciado, uh guru type, um, expert. Uh, I'm always trying to give you guys and gals the strategies that you need to make sure that you're uh, uh, in the best possible position to be able to get the most out of your life. And so one of the main things I believe is to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with the right kind of people. And at the same time, possibly, and I've touched upon this before, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go deep. I'm going to tell you some stories, which I think maybe you might not have heard before. And also making sure that some of the people who are the naysayers and the finger pointers and the wannabes and the complainers and the whiners and the, and the, and the curmudgeon types, to see if you can begin to uh, gently, carefully, strategically move them away from your life. All right? And so I, I want to start out with a silly story, a little story. Now, this hat, you see this hat? This is a Gold's Gym hat. You know, I'm not a member of Gold's Gym, but why would I have a Gold's Gym hat? It's because of a particular individual by the name of Mr. Don Murphy. Now, Don Murphy was one of many of my friends that was here uh, at my home. Uh, he slept downstairs, downstairs. And um, how would I have met a Don Murphy? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I early on had a bit of an advantage when it came to meeting other people because I was with a company known as, known, known as Beachbody. And Beachbody would send me around the country and I would also volunteer to go to different kind of uh, uh, towns and cities around because um, people wanted to meet me and have me do seminars and speeches and talks and workouts and stuff like that. So I was very fortunate in that way, and many of you don't have that opportunity, but we're going to get into the weeds a little bit about how you can build your community, have more fellowship, more friendship, more camaraderie, more partnerships, right? Because uh, if you do, then again, we, you uh, will have a greater likelihood to be where you want to be when it comes to your health and wellness and fitness. And so I'll give you some strategies too about that. That's all coming up. So let's get back to the hat. Let's get back to the hat. I'm going to undo that so you can see me better. So many moons ago, um, when I learned early on that the word yes was much more valuable than the word no. And the word no is a, is a nice word because it prevents you from having any experiences if that's what you're looking for. Uh, it prevents you from getting outside of your comfort zone if that's something that you don't want to do. Um, it forces you to be around other people and make those kinds of connections. And, and, uh, and for some people who are sad and depressed and anxious and worried and nervous and freaked out, they don't want to have those exchanges because it's kind of too overwhelming, you know. And, and I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a bit of an isolator myself. I like being alone. 
I, I really do. It's one of my favorite things. That's why I married my wife, Shauna. She likes being alone. So we don't even see each other for more than twice a year. I'm kidding, of course. We like being together, but we also like our time apart. But at the same time, if you understand what I'm talking about, which is how important are friendships, partnerships, community, relationships, companionships, camaraderie, fellowship, togetherness, and connection when it gets when it comes to almost every aspect of your life. I'm not even talking about just exercise and eating right. You know, I'm talking about you know, uh, creativity and productivity and, and, um, and adventure and, and uh, the di different kinds of things that different kinds of people will bring to you if you're well-connected, if you have a well-rounded group of people. Uh, Like-minded is help helpful, but also people who are very different than you too. That's kind of essential as well. So they shouldn't be all the same, right? Can't, like if you're going to hang out with just Buddhists, you're going to miss out on what all the Catholics and the Muslims and the Jews and the... And various people have to do and say they're different than yours. I hope Now, here's the key. All these people that we talk about have to be good people. They have to be nice people. They have to be sweet people and kind people. You have to be thoughtful people. All right? They might be different than you in every shape or form. Different colors, you know, different heights, different weights, different everything. But in, in general, within a short period of time, you should be able to figure out whether they're good people or not. And usually good people are... Like, you know, we talked about this last week, are selfless people. They're not selfish people. They're, they're humble people. They're not churlish people. They're, um, uh, you don't have, they don't have to be funny, but they, it'd be nice if they had a sense of humor, too. And, you know, and then if they do, then you'll kind of maybe hang around those kind of people. And you'll laugh more because it's all about joy, happiness, and laughter. Now, I digress once again. digress once again because I want to tell you about this hat. So many moons ago, I was asked to go to... Uh, Don Murphy's gym in upstate New York. Now, uh, Don now owns, uh, he owns the, the biggest gold's gym in the country, and he also owns another one uh, not far not far from that one. And so, um, as I recall, this gig that I was invited to do didn't pay much or anything at all. Um, you know, and at that stage in my career, uh, you know, I was looking to get... <laughs> I was looking to do the types of things that would help provide some income so I could continue to, you know, uh, uh, afford things. And um, but in this particular case, uh, it sounded like a really cool thing. And so, you know, I lived in Southern California and and Don's gym was in uh, upstate New York. So that required some travel and it required, um, uh, you know, I think he put me up, as I recall. Um, and. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, I was going in blind, right? I didn't know anybody. I didn't know really. I knew that I was going to do a workout. I was going to give a small talk. Um, and, uh, and I knew that it was really going to, you know, pay me very much. But something in my, in my head said, you got to go. Like saying no meant missing out on the opportunity. So it required an action. It required movement. It required planning. It, there was some strategery here. That's a made-up word. I can't remember where I've heard that word before. I'm going to wait, right? And so I, I make my way from Southern California all the way up to upstate New York, and I meet Don Murphy, and um, and uh, and I do this event at his, at his gym, and, um, and I ended up doing a second one at his gym because I just loved everything he was doing. His facility is state-of-the-art, incredible, amazing. Uh, he's just a world-class, fun guy. And um, I also found out that he was a skier. Didn't know that the first time, but I found out after the second time. And um, so if I had said no to that, right? If I had said, mm, nah, I don't know, I got enough going on. I was too busy. You know, there's a lot of reasons why I could have said no. And a lot of, maybe a lot of opportunities that have maybe been presented to you where you could have met other people and had those exchanges and, 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 and uh, uh, built that community and, and made those friendships but you said no, so none of that happened. That was all smoke and uh, mirrors, sort of. And um, so, you know, I, I went a second time because the first time was kind of amazing. And again, I got to work out uh, in his gym and get to, you know, meet a bunch of people. And, you know, Don and I are very close and have been ever since. And he was staying here in the house and he was here, here for the yoga and ski retreat. And I would consider Don one of my dearest, best friends in the world. Now, I only get to see him twice a year uh, because we're close. We, I love his kids and his wife. Um, Tammy's amazing. Um, and why would I bring up Tammy? Because Tammy was part of saving my life. 
So if I had never gone to the gym and I had never met Don and I hadn't done it a second time, I would have never met his wife. And why would have, why would have Tammy saved my life? So when I got Ramsey Hunt syndrome, um, uh, there was, uh, you know, Tammy was deep into, uh, I don't know, endocrinology or, or, you know, nutrition science or whatever you want to call it. She's probably got a better name for it than I do. And so after, you know, talking to Don and then talking to Tammy, uh, she said, hey, it's really important that we do some tests on why you have inflammation all over your body and you might have leaky gut, you might have leaky brain. And I know you have, uh, uh, you know, you're still suffering from um, uh, not Ramsey Hunt, but uh, vestibular hypofunction. And maybe there's some tests that we can do to help you. So we did, and it was about, I don't know, 138 pages. We covered every single type of food on the earth. And she, you know, put together this three month protocol for me to cut out wheat, soy, corn, and dairy, which I still do to this day because of Tammy Murphy, because I went up to upstate New York and met her husband. I don't even know if they were married yet at that point. Um, I don't even think they didn't, have, they didn't have kids at that point. I know that for, for a fact. And so if you think about that trail there from saying yes, traveling across the country, meeting Don, and then meeting his wife later, uh, and then she happened to be the person uh, along with a gal by the name of Heather Fitzgerald. And the two of them uh, were the king's horses and they were the king's women who helped put me back together again. And that's purely because I decided to say yes and I made a connection. Um, not only did uh, Tammy literally change the way I look at food and why I eat and certain kinds of supplementation uh, to this day, uh, and, and I got a tremendous friendship out of the two of them. And they, they come out in the summertime and hang out with Sean and I and their kids. And it's just, you know, I wish I saw them more. I wish we lived closer together. But they are two people that I would consider two of my best friends in the world. And I love them to death. And that's an important thing that if I had said no or I didn't take some sort of action or I didn't go out of my way because I had to go out of my way to go from one side of the country to the other side of the country um, uh, to make that happen. Um, now, I'll give you another example, and I'm gonna t there's going to be multiple stories like this, so get ready, sit back, and think about maybe if, you have, if you're missing out on certain connections with certain people <clears throat> based on lack of action in the past, maybe some of these stories will ignite a desire for you to begin and make some change in meeting some new people. <clears throat> so look at Scott Morgan. Scott Morgan. Why would I even know Scott Morgan? Now, I was with Beachbody, and, and at some point... Beachbody connected with Scott, or I believe Scott actually reached out to Beachbody because he was a big uh, P90X2 fan. He had done P90X and P90X2. And he wanted, he reached out to them um, to see if I would uh, do a segment uh, about stretching, pre-golf pre uh, uh, stretching, right? So um, I wasn't sure if it was P90X2 or P90X3. You'll have to remind me, Scott, with which one it was. And again, this is another thing where, now keep in mind, when I was younger, and I had opportunities like this. I always, I almost all, all automatically said no because I had my, I had my thing, I had my routine, I had my friends. I was pretty much happy with that. It was all very comfortable. Uh, it was, it was, did not ever get me out of my comfort zone. But and, you know, after f whatever three dozen personal development books, one of the main lessons I learned in all of them was, you can't say no to opportunities which make you a little uncomfortable. And I didn't think, you know, go meeting a guy in a golf course and, and doing some stretching and, and taking a few whacks at some golf balls was going to be, you know, so, so scary uh, or create any kind of major fear. It was just another thing that was, I had to add to my, what at that time was a pretty busy schedule. But I said, yeah, all right. So I go and I meet Scott. And he's just the most pleasant, wonderful guy in the world. And we do this little routine and we shoot it. And I don't know where it ended up, somewhere in Beach Bodies. Uh, social media or somewhere else, but um, and we just got along, and it was a great day. And I, I don't even know if we we uh, exchanged emails or phone numbers. But about a year later, Scott reached out to Shauna. Now he took the initiative on that one because if he hadn't, we probably I would have never had another interaction with him whatsoever. And he said, "Hey, you know what would it what would it cost for me to come up to your house and work out with Tony? You know what was a private workout?" And then. And then she described who he was. And I went, oh, yeah, that guy, Scott. He, yeah, I did that little thing with Beachbody a year or something ago. And uh, there you are, Scott. Am I getting the story right, dude? Let me know if I'm getting it wrong. Um, uh, I said, no, he doesn't have to pay anything. I, whatever. You know what I mean? Just send him over to the house. And so before I moved to uh, 
uh, to Nashville, uh, he was pretty much at my house five days a week for years. And, um, and we're still very, very good friends today. And he's had such an amazing influence on all of you. Because last month, uh, Scotty Moe's um, Motown workout program was the number one on, on the Power Nation platform. And so, you know, it was, it was another opportunity that I was given to say yes, to go meet a guy I didn't know and, uh, and shoot a thing. And uh, to me, it, was, it had come and gone. And then he reached out to Sean. I said, come on over. We became good friends. You know, he went from a golf pro to somebody who was based on my influence, I suppose, um, really interested in, in changing his life and changing the lives of others. That's right up his alley. He was a skier slash ski instructor. He was a golfer slash golf instructor. So those, that was kind of in his, his DNA. And now he's found sort of his third, his third, um, uh, by the way, my vestibular hypofunction is about a four today, so I'm really trying to fake it. I'm just, I got a little brain fog, and uh, if I run out of things to say, it's because of that, and I apologize. Um, he's found his new raison d'etre, all right? So I went from not knowing what to say to using French. It's so exciting. The human brain words are in there, and they're dying to come out in various ways so that I can connect with you, all right? And, and so Scott was here uh, for the retreat as well. And here's the beautiful thing. A total stranger, a guy I had to go do a gig with, uh, turns out to have the number one program on the platform, shows up to the, uh, I think it's the eighth time that he's been to the Ted and Tony Yoga Ride Ski Retreat. And he, ha he had a major, major, he's not only had a major influence on a lot of you, but he had a major influence on a lot of the people that were here this weekend because his whole thing is about giving and sharing and helping other people. And if I had never met him, then guaranteed this event with Ted and I would not have been as good. And it happened because of Scotty Mo. Again, Scotty Mo Garin. <laughs> There's just two stories. All right, now here's a fun one. All right, this is a really fun one. I'm gonna go way back, 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 back. And speaking of Scots, I wanna talk about Scott Pfeiffer. Um, yeah, I know you really wanna do that ski yoga retreat. You should do it next year. So, so and I want you to try to stay with me on this connection of people that was made. Now, many, many years ago, um, I, was a, I was a handyman and I was a go-go dancer at Chippendales. Yeah, that's a real thing. I wasn't one of the main dancers. I actually, after the show was over, the, they let the guys in to Chippendales at 10 o'clock. And, uh, and then I got a gig because I met a girl at a club who liked the way I danced. And she said, hey, do you want to be a go-go dancer at Chippendales after hours? And I said, sure. <laughs> Had I ever been a go-go dancer? We're talking Capizio dance shoes, tiger socks, Dolphin shorts and a cutoff tank top right above the belly button. It was the 90, early 90s. Um, and so, yeah, so I went, I auditioned, they loved me, and, uh, and I danced on a box uh, for a summer. That was a life. I digress. So um, that was one of the many gigs I had. I was also a carpenter and handyman and a, and a waiter and a bartender, and I built boxes for furniture. And that's, you know, uh, and then... Uh, here comes the, uh, um, the vestibular stuff again. Please hold. Um, the only reason why I ever became a trainer is because, and many of you know the story, I started training my boss um, uh, over at 20th Century Fox when I was a, a, a runner, a.k.a. A PA, a.k.a. production assistant. And uh, his name was Harlan Goodman, and he was the first guy I ever trained. And I, usually when I tell this story, I say that Tom Petty was the second person I ever trained because of Harlan Goodman. But the truth is there was a uh, producer over at 20th Century Fox named Sandra Roosh. And Sandra Roosh, I can't even hmm, – I met Sandra Roosh through a guy I was training – I think he was really the, first, the second or third person named Dick Delson. Now, none of these names mean anything to any of you. I'm just saying like how it all hopscotches to where I am today. So Dick Delson, I met in a hardware store and started talking to him. 
and we got talking about well, what do you do? Because I, I was helping him in the hardware store when it came to whatever nails or screws or hammer or hacksaw. I, I don't know what it was because I was a handyman and he was there and he looked confused. So I helped him out. And um, I said, also oh, a trainer. He goes, I could use a trainer. So I would drive from Santa Monica, California, all the way to the valley, and I would start training Dick Delson. And then I started training his wife. So, uh-oh. Uh, and then shortly after that, Harlan Goodman introduced me to Tom Petty. And he was, Tom was my first ever celebrity client. So, so I'm not really, I don't have to be a, 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 a go-go dancer anymore. I don't, I don't have to really build furniture anymore. I don't have to wait tables anymore, even though I still did once in a while. And now I'm a trainer. And now I've got, I've got Harlan Goodman, uh, Dick Delson and his wife, whose name I forgot. I, if she's listening, I apologize. And then Sandra Roosh. And Sandra Roosh was a friend of Dick Delson's, and I would used to go to uh, Sandra Roosh's house at five in the morning, Whew, very early. And then uh, one day, uh, Sandra Roosh's sister, Donna Dubro, different last names, but same, still sisters, were like, what are you doing with it? You actually got a guy coming to your garage and training you in your house? Like, who is this person? Did you vet this person? Like, what is, and she says, well, he's training, um, Tom Petty, so he must know what he's doing. So thank you, Harlan Goodman, because if it wasn't for that, then, I, then maybe Donna Dubrow would have never said anything. So Donna Dubrow felt like, nah, not my thing. I don't want, to, I don't want a guy coming to my house to train me. Uh, and then eventually when she was noticing that her sister was getting healthier and, and leaner and, and fitter, Donna went, okay, I'm gonna, I want to try this thing. So I would, I would start with Sandra and I'd go to Donna and Donna was my second client. Uh, and then I would run off to one or two before I got to Tom Petty and, and Billy Idol and Bruce Springsteen and Stephen Stills and Annie Lennox and uh, all those other celebrity types. All right. Um, so here's the crazy thing. And this is all going to lead to a series of things that were the most important things that ever happened to me. And again, we're back to friendship, partnership, community, relationships, companionship, camaraderie, fellowship, togetherness, and connection. And how this is also very important when it comes to your health and your wellness and your, your, your opportunities. And this is really about opportunities more than anything. So Donna Dubro, hang with me because with me, it's going to be exciting at the end. We only hope. It's going to do, the story's building and then it's going to hit a plateau and then it's going to psh, psh, take off. So Donna says, you know, you might like my son. He's a good guy and, and uh, you know what I mean? He's a little bit younger than you, but, you know, he's, you're, you guys have very similar personalities and sense of humors and whatnot. So um, Dick Delson, Sandra Roosh, Donna Dubro, and her son, e Ethan Dubro. So now I got a new person. Now, a lot of times if somebody some out there in the world, they don't want to continue to build this ever-ending pile of people in their life. Some people just don't want to. And my feeling is that if that's the way you think, then your world is smaller. So I was, you know, I was still starting out. I was not known by anybody. There was no such thing as, as, as Power 90, P90X, none of that yet. I was just a lone trainer who didn't have to, you know, wait tables as much and, and dance on a box at Chippendales, right? So things were shifting for me purely based on the fact that I was I was saying yes to new people in my life, all right? Total strangers, one second, dear dear friends and important uh, relationships that I was building. And then Ethan Dubrow and I, we hang out a little bit. He's a really good guy. He's funny. I really enjoy his company. Um, and then at one point, he hired me uh, um, to train uh, Sean Connery. Uh, that's how I was able to train Sean Connery on a, a get him ready for a movie called Music Man, uh, Medicine Man, which they shot in Mexico. So no Dick Delson, no Sandra Roosh, no Donna Dubro, no Ethan Dubro, no Sean Connery. You understand how that all da, 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 built up? And so that, you know, submarines don't react well to bullets. That's my Sean Connery. And so I got to train uh, Sean. We were on a first name basis. Uh, for about three months before he went off to Mexico and did the movie. So, okay, that, is there anything more to Ethan Dubrow? He goes, no, no, there's more. So Ethan said, you know what? There's a guy that I went to high school with, and uh, he's a fitness guy just like you. Um, and I know I've told this story. A lot of you have heard of it already. And uh, you guys should connect. I'm going to give you both each other's phone number. This is before email or text, right? 
And so now I got a guy's phone number in my hand, and that guy has my phone number in his hand, and we're looking at it. And Ethan tells this guy, this fellow, Bobby Stevenson, there's this guy named Tony Horton, and you guys should hook up. Now, I stopped there. I stopped at Ethan. I wasn't going to call a total stranger to go work out. It just felt weird to me. But Bobby, being the guy that he is, reached out to me. And so, you know, Bobby's like, hey, man, uh, on the phone, well, uh, you know, Ethan, he's a friend of mine, went to high school, you want to go on a run uh, and do a workout down at the beach. And I was like, oh, my God, what am I doing? And I really didn't want to because when it came to fitness in those days, I was sticking to my guns. I wanted to lift the weights in the gym and I wanted to do whatever cardio I was doing in the gym. And occasionally I would go for a run, but I did not want to get outside of my comfort zone uh, at all in those days. And then a little tiny weak voice, little angel maybe. Hey, Tony, what are you doing? Don't say no to this guy. You should probably. Like my angel, it's a finger that's moving around like a worm. Uh, you should do it. So I said, okay, where do you want to meet? So we met at this uh, kind of a famous place in Santa Monica called the Fourth Street Stairs. And so Bobby and I'm, hey, ma'am, I'm Tony. We had a short conversation and we ran down the stairs and we ran underneath Pacific Coast Highway. And then we ran along the uh, uh, this long um, uh, promenade out on the beach. And we ended up at the... Uh, not the classic bodybuilding part of Venice where, you know, all the bodybuilders are, but it's sort of the uh, old school, right just south of the Santa Monica Pier where Jack LaLanne and all his buddies used to work out. So there were uh, 25 foot ropes, 20, 50, I think 17, 15 foot ropes, parallel bars, rings, big grassy area to do whatever you wanted to do. And I had lived in Santa Monica for years and years and years and looked at all that equipment and I went, oh, what am well, that's not, I want to go do that. I want to go into the gym. So Bobby introduced me to climbing ropes. Bobby introduced me to playing around on the parallel bars. Bobby introduced me to doing various ab moves uh, on the grassy area that was near all that. So there was all this equipment on the beach and um, I got my, my butt absolutely destroyed. I mean, and then we would run three, mi three miles to that and then we would run three miles back and I couldn't move for days. And I thought I was in shape. Thank you, Bobby Stevenson. I'm going to wave to you. Um, and so, you know, does it end there? No. If you look at, if you look at parts of, of not really Power 90, but certainly P90X and P90X2, that was as a result of Dick Delson, Sandra Roosh, Donna Dubro, Ethan Dubro, Bobby Stevenson. So the things that I've created that have changed a lot of your lives came from making those connections, from making those friendships, creating those companionships, you know, having, you know, making those connections. You know, think of how much, though, that took years and time and yes, a lot of yes to get to Bobby Stevenson, right? And so... <laughs> Is there more to Bobby Stevenson? Well, obviously he was cast in Power 90 and P90X2 and I think P90X3. So, you know, Bobby has been an intricate part and also the next level that I do with Gaim uh, TV, TV uh, yoga TV. Um, you know, and Bobby's been in almost everything I've ever done. And at one point he was a friend of 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 a sisters of a brother. Of the, of the, of the, and then there's that Tony Curran. What? Don't let me get to the Tony Curran story. Holy crap. There he, and me, he writes. Darling man, look at you. Pfeiffer has joined. So so here's the thing. Now, I got Curran and Pfeiffer. I don't see Bobby here. So we'll get into these. So what else about Bobby Stevenson? Now, when we would go down to the beach, it was just he and I when we first started, right? And I'm taking notes and I'm getting my ass handed to me. And it was really, really hard. But I mean, I could do pull-ups, but I couldn't climb a rope to save my life because... It hurt my hands. It was just a different feeling. I, hurt, I used to give me, used to give us fifeitis. We'll get into why. The, Bobby is a specimen, current, and so are you once when I got done with you, pal. Um, anyway, um, so, you know, uh, occasionally I would be out of town and Bobby would go down there and do his thing. And, and we would see this guy on the rings. You know, I'm not really paying attention to the person. You know, Bobby would go up to anybody and everybody that was within a 500 yard radius of us working out and ask if they'd want to join us. And so there was this guy 
by the, who was a ring guy, like the rings you'd swing from one to the other, you go back and forth, not an easy thing to do. Had a lot of shoulder and, and lat mobility there and a lot of, you know, sort of a skill thing. And we, I would see this guy on occasion. I never gave him, you know, I never gave him any of my attention. But one weekend I was gone and Bobby went up to this guy. Now, Bobby would go up to a guy with a, with a hypodermic needle in his arm and go, hey, man, put that down. Let's go do some push-ups. That's just kind of about who Bobby is. And so one week I come back and there's, and then Scott, you can correct me if this story is slightly off and I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Um, there's this guy there uh, uh, and he introduces himself as Scott Pfeiffer. And I'm like, oh, oh, there's that, there's that guy that was kind of staring at us a lot. Like he would show up and do the rings and just kind of look at our group and go, and Scott would always say, when he used to look over at me and Bobby and a few other guys, he goes, those guys aren't probably good guys. I wouldn't want to go over and hang out with those guys or even ask to be with those guys. And it, it was Bobby Stevenson who took the initiative um, to invite Scott. And I show up and go, oh, well, who's this guy? It's the ring guy is joining us now? Okay. And the group kept uh, growing and growing. And one week I show up. Um, and there's this, there's this guy who's doing amazing things on the parallel bars and climbing ropes and, and, you know, doing handstands with ease. His name was Chuck Gaylord. Chuck Gaylord was, is, uh, uh, Mitch Gaylord's older brother. Mitch Gaylord won three medals uh, in the 84 LA games. And, uh, we didn't even know. I remember we were like a couple weeks into working out with, Chuck, what's your last name? Gaylord. Gaylord. Oh my God! You mean like Mitch Gaylord? That's a weird coincidence. How? What are the odds of that? That he's a a a, 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 a really good gymnast, and you're a pretty good one too. I mean, that's crazy. And then Chuck says, "Well, that's my brother." And I go, "Ah, oh, you're funny. That's so funny that you would say that just because you have the same last name." And Chuck looked at me like I was an idiot, <clears throat> and said, "Yeah, that, that's my brother. That's why I'm a gymnast, and he's a gymnast, and I got him ready for the '84 Olympics. And now I'm working out with this guy. So I got Chuck Gaylord. I got, and then Mitch showed up a bunch of times later on, and he he was pretty out of shape when he started. And about seven weeks later, he was it was freakish to see how quickly he got strong. So now there's Bobby, and there's Chuck Gaylord, and then there's our other friends, our friend Rami, and and, uh, uh, you know, just a handful of friends uh, uh, just were hanging out. There was a bunch of us um, just because we were all doing the same thing. We were all, you know, communing down there at the beach. It was a regular thing. It went on for years and years and years. And um, at some point along the way, this Scott Pfeiffer fellow, uh, Bobby was a good friend. And then Chuck uh, became a good friend. And then uh, uh, our friend Rami, who was a friend of Chuck's, became a good friend. And um, and then, of course, don't smash your face. I guess anybody can tell me who said that in P90X. I think you know who that is. Um, I'll wait for an answer. I'll give you guys a little Q and A. Um, Shauna is here too. Oh, I better I better behave. Um, and so we had this little posse, right? Because Dick Delson in a hardware store was looking to f figure out to buy the right kind of nails. <laughs> who introduces me to? Sandra Roosh, who introduces me to Donna Dubrow, who introduces me to Ethan Dubrow, who introduces me to Bobby Stevenson. Bobby Stevenson finds this Scott Pfeiffer fellow. All right. And so that was my world. It was pretty fun. And at some point, you know, Scott was a was a screenwriter, uh, a very talented one. He was also a lawyer. He was a smart guy and still is. And, you know, what? Uh, as a screenwriter, I mean, he wrote a lot of the jokes that you would see during the Emmys and Oscars. You see the two actors come out on stage and they would read those teleprompters. Scott wrote a lot of those jokes. He was also a big shot uh, lawyer as well. Uh, I don't know if he was an entertainment lawyer. And then one day, I remember, you know, because he was a friend now, he was. we were all hanging out, going out, eating together. And, you know, it just there's something about Bobby's vibe and Scott's vibe that said, these these guys got to be in my life. Uh, just enjoy them. And, and they're local. They're unlike Don Murphy, who gave me the hat. You know, he lives far away. And he'd probably be, if he lived in LA, he'd be part of the crew as well. And Scott said, you know what? I'm going to, I, I have all these options to go on a kind of a working vacation. And which one should I go to? And so he consulted me and Bobby and others. And one of them was uh, uh, this orphanage, orphanage at the bottom of Kilimanjaro uh, called Tunahaki. And uh, this guy, Dave, uh, created this thing from nothing. And he took these kids off the street. Um, I forget the name of the city. What was that city that, at the bottom, where these kids were? And he built this orphanage and he taught these kids how to do gymnastics and juggle and everything else. So anybody who was climbing Kilimanjaro, they had to walk by the Tuna Hockey Orphanage to watch these kids and they would give them money, you know, and, the, and that, that fed them and gave them something other than dirt to sleep on. 
and they were getting an education and they were they're creating their own community. And Scott was there for, I think, three weeks. And he came back and went, that's it. No more screenwriting. No more lawyering. Uh, I want to be part of this. This is something. This is this is game changer for me. And so um, we're like, wow, that's a massive shift. Let me see if he's still here and um, if he's saying anything. Waving. Um, we're like, wow, okay, great. And so he worked with David Tuna Hockey for some time. And he realized shortly thereafter that that – you know, just one orphanage in one place at the base of Kilimanjaro was not enough. He had learned what he needed to learn. He had helped those 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 kids and worked with Dave as much as he could. And then um, at one point, Scott decided he raised money to have, I think, about a dozen or so orphans who lived in one place, who lived in the street, who... Um, had never had anything, and were they? They had never. They'd never. They've seen planes, and they have never been one. Never. They were never in an escalator. They, they were never in a fancy hotel room. And all of a sudden, these kids are on an airplane, and they flew all the way from Africa to Southern California. And they they were they were at my house. They were at other people's houses. And uh, one of the kids that really stuck out to Scott was this kid Leonce, or Leonce. And uh, Scott basically adopted him along the way, and now Leonce is. Uh, uh, in China, in Taiwan, a uh, speaking Mandarin, <laughs> or is it the other version of? I'm not sure. Um, and he's a wonderful kid, and he's just bright and smart and incredible. Now, <laughs> look, I had nothing to do with that, but it's just kind of amazing to witness a person's journey. That he's a screenwriter and a lawyer, and he decides to go do this thing, and now he's helped. Scott's helped. I don't know, 150,000 orphans around the world from Tennessee to Tanzania and everywhere else all over the country all over the US all over the world and he has fundraisers every year and now he's pals with Ewan McGregor and other big shot movie stars like Tony Curran um, so here's another neat thing about about uh, so let's let's pause on Scott Pfeiffer here for a second and we're gonna go back to Ethan Dubro now uh, because I was training uh, his aunt and his mom uh, Ethan said, hey, look, there's a, uh, and I know you've trained um, Sean Connery because he made the introduction. Uh, there's a movie up in Canada uh, at the time. The working title was called Eaters of the Dead. It was a uh, Michael Crichton novel. It eventually became The 13th Warrior with Antonio Banderas. And uh, and I got, I was hired to be there for three weeks. I ended up being there three and a half months. It's another story. And one of the knuckleheads that was there was uh, Mr. Tony Kern. And uh, yeah, we hit that, that he's a Scottish version of me and uh, uh, completely out of his mind and very, very talented and funny as can be and just the world's greatest company. And I love the man to death. And, um, you know, we've, again, I've stayed friends for a very long time and still am. And Tony's one of my regular workout guys when I live, when I'm in L.A. Um, and, uh, you know, it's always fun to turn on a TV or a movie and there's there's this happy shiny face if you haven't seen mayfly mayflies mayflies yet tony tell them where they can find it it is it's an amazing two-part series about a man who's dying from cancer and how he deals with it and tony plays that man and he made shauna cry twice and then uh the flight of the phoenix he's in the flight of the phoenix and he made my wife cry there too tony just likes to make my wife cry and everything he does um except when he plays van gogh or or something else um so, you know, no Ethan, no Tony Kern, right? Togetherness, fellowship, camaraderie, com companionship, relationship, partnership, friendship. Now, a lot of people out there, they got the same high school friends as they have from high school and college, and maybe they don't, they're not, they've moved and they don't, they don't have the, these kinds of relationships. And I can tell you, you know, I'm going to pause here for a second in regards to, you know, these stories. This, this has been... For me, the most valuable part of who I've become, more so than whatever kinesiology articles I've read or whatever kind of fitness opportunities I've been given. It's really, it's really my, my friends and, and the connections I've made and the opportunities they provided for me. So Bobby Stevenson, right? There he is. He's in all my stuff now. He's still a great friend. And, uh, and uh, I remember when... Um, when he was thinking about going from uh, being a manager at his mother's clothing store to uh, 
owning a, a casting agency, he was kind of not going to do it. He was, he just, it seemed too daunting and too scary and having his own business and it's nothing he'd ever done before. And Scott Pfeiffer and I, his friends that he gathered along the way, we both said, if you don't do it, we won't be your friend anymore because we will be disgusted by that choice of not doing it, not taking that chance. And we both said, you got to do it. You got to try it because if you don't, you'll never know. And I don't know how much of an influence that we had, Scott, but I get the feeling we had a pretty good influence. And now, now Bobby owns one of the best and busiest casting agencies, commercial cast, casting agencies in L.A. And oh, by the way, my friend from college, Bill Bondi, uh, that's another story, but I can't tell all of them. Uh, his daughter uh, is an independent filmmaker, and she moved to L.A. to be part of a, a thing with her school um, last year. And then uh, I called Bobby and I said, you got anything for her name is Zaza or Isabel? And uh, he said, yeah, let me meet her. And now Zaza works for Bobby. You see all the beautiful connections that are happening here. Like, here's this girl. I just don't know anything about L.A. All I know is that my dad's friend Tony lives there and... I don't know, he's not really in the movie industry, but maybe he knows people and blah, blah, blah. Now she's got this beautiful gig and Bobby loves her and she does an amazing work and she's amazing. And one day she'll make a movie and I'll be in it. I'll play somebody's great, great grandfather. I don't know. So let's get back to Scott Pfeiffer here for a second. This kind of odd guy. <laughs> Scott love it. Like, why is he saying that? Um, not odd. I'm odd. Um, he's got, he realizes that, that, he needs to expand the the concept on how to help people. So the one way to do this is to have a fundraiser. Now, at that point, you know, I made my connection with, with Mr. Carl Deichler, and Carl experimented. Uh, you know, the only reason why I know Carl Deichler, and a lot of you heard that story, is I read a little passage in a book that said, go out of your way, do something nice for somebody else. And so I go, all right, I've got to check this box with this guy I used to play basketball with. I didn't like, he didn't like me. His name was Ben. Ben, I did it anyway. I thought he was going to say no about the workouts, and he said yes. And a year later, he introduced me to Carl. And Carl said, let's do this thing just as a side gig, great body guaranteed. And it worked. I didn't have any royalties or anything. I just made a, you know, made a, like a couple thousand dollars, which to me at that time was like, holy smokes. And it worked. And so he goes, what do you want to do next? And I go, I don't know. What do you want to do? He says, let's do, let's do a 90-day program. How do you, how, what do you do with your celebrity clients? Can you do that in front of a TV? I said, I'll figure it out. And we did. And we did Power 90. And uh, I got to move out of my, house, my apartment after 21 and a half years and buy a house. House didn't have a whole lot of furniture because, uh-oh. You can't, you can't, if you have a nice house, you can't use a construction pine that looks like an apple box uh, as your dining room table. It's just, so I didn't have any furniture. And then, so, cut to, at that point, you know, Scott was witness to some of this journey of mine. And uh, he said, hey, you've got a house. And I don't know that many people that have houses. And I want to do a fundraiser. Can I do it at your house? And I went, Okay. I was like, oh, my brand new house and a bunch of people I don't know, and they're all strangers. And so at first I was like, oh, dude, there's got to be someplace else you can do it. Because, I mean, I just bought this place and it's pristine and, and I don't want a bunch of people marching through the house. And he looked at me like, do you want to help orphans or do you want to be a, a jerk? <laughs> I'm like, okay. So there's a bunch of people in the house. And when I was there, I met this, uh, Met a lot of people, but one of the people who I thought was just so intriguing and so interesting and so funny and just a total stranger, her name was Tamara Kay. Still a great friend to this day. Uh, she lives in Arizona. And, you know, uh, we were friends and we went out to dinner a bunch of times and we had a lot of laughs. And uh, she was just great company. And she got, you know, kind of in the circle a little bit with some of the guys. And um, no romantic thing there, uh, but just a great, great person. And after a while, you know, she knew I was single and I was dating people here and there and it was, wasn't going very well. And uh, she said, you know what, these women that you're dating, they're not, you need somebody, you need a quality woman, you need a kind woman, you need a smart woman, you need a funny woman, you like sexy women, she's going to cover the bill, all right? Um, so, you know, so she goes, well, you're, I want, you're going to meet this girl, you might not ever, nothing might come of it. Uh... Her name is uh, Shauna Brannon or Swenson, depending on what point of her life. I go, okay. And so I don't know how much time went by. You know, Shauna lived in uh, 
Arizona, Scottsdale, Phoenix area. And that's where, where Tamara knew her from. And then uh, one day she just said, hey, you remember that gal I told you about? I've told her all about you and, I, you know, I've told you all about her. And and you guys are two peas in a pod. I, again, you, you know, long-term relationship, probably not. I don't know. But you're going to be great friends just because she's a cool lady. I'm like, okay. So uh, I got my friend Brian there, Brian um, Entman. And so Shauna and Tamara knocked on my Brand new door, my brand new house that we had just done a fundraiser for, for Scott Pfeiffer, who was introduced to me by Bobby Stevenson, who was introduced to me by Ethan Dubrow, who was introduced to me by Donna Dubrow, who was introduced to me by Sandra Roosh, who was introduced to me by Dick Delson. Pfft. What? And open the door, and there's my future wife standing in front of me. And, uh, you know, first impression was like, yowza. You know, this is a this is a very very amazing looking woman, and by the end of the weekend, I was like, "This is a goofy, silly, funny, amazing, wonderful, smart, incredible person." And so, you know, it, I married her six years later. There's a lot of stuff in between, but you know, whatever. Um, so that's kind of awesome. Um, and if you look at uh, in my career, all right? So here's this woman who now I trust her with everything, everything. Like I, I won't even go for a walk in the woods until she says go because she'll tell me whether there's lions, tigers, or bears out there to take to, to eat me up. Um, what else we got here, people? I'm looking, I'm looking. A wave? Is there another wave? There's Mary. Mary. Uh, I keep hoping for Mr. Curran will, will come to Playa. Never happening. Never happening. Um... There's a wave. Dink, dink. <laughs> Tony is a is a Tuesday Thursday guy. Um, what else? Look at these things. Where do they? Where, I'm just gonna let them go right out there. Just look like I'm homeless. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, of course. Well, there is, but there's things we can do about it. Um, we love Shauna, don't we? Though, don't we all? Sean was like, I didn't get, I didn't know you were going to do this whole thing about me. And by the way, you know, there are, there are dozens and dozens of other stories. Like my friend, Stephen Clark, who was a friend of, who was married to one of Shauna's best friends, uh, Lori, who's in her Bible study class. And so I had met Stephen a couple times and he seemed okay. He's kind of a conservative guy. He's a, he's a, 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 an entertainment attorney. I thought he was kind of stuffy and kind of quiet. And I go, and then, so at one point I, I even asked Sean, I said, you know, Stephen's working out. He's think he's you think he might want to come over to the house and work out. And she said, "Why don't you ask him?" And so I did. And so he just turned out to be just the greatest dude in the world. And he's so smart and so funny and, and just incredible. And he came out here for 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 like four days with Brian Palatucci uh, and skied with me. And I didn't even you know one minute it was like, nah, "Do I want to really meet this guy?" Do I really want to, you know, he's like kind of your, your friend's husband. I don't know if there's any kind of connection there. And let me, let me just say this, Stephen, uh, I'm in a movie. Maybe you guys have seen the post for it, but I'm in a movie that's coming out shortly called An Autumn Summer. And I don't have an entertainment attorney. Well, it just turns out that Stephen Clark is an entertainment attorney and he structured the deal for me for my contract for the movie. Like everywhere I look, everywhere I go, there is somebody in my life that fills in the blanks because I went out of my way over and over and over again over the course of decades to reach out for people without the intention of having them do contracts for anything, without the intention of having them introduce me to my wife, without, you know, have them introduce me to Sean Connery or Tony Curran or anything else. They're just good people. But here's the thing, and this is the whole point of this whole conversation I'm having, this talk, is that if you are limiting yourself to specific amount of people, a certain, a specific type of people, then you're looking at the world like this. You're only going to see so much. You're only going to go so many places. You're only going to have so many adventures or not. You're going to have a very limited, small life. And for, and for, and you think about it, one of the easiest things to do, it's not like I'm asking you to do a bunch of push-ups or pull-ups or eat freaking vegetables every meal of the day. I'm just asking you to go out in the world and say hello. 
and just say, hey, what's up? What are you up to? What do you want to try? And, and how do you, you know, there's, there's a, this, this, is, this is everything. You are the company you keep.